Hello, uh, my name is Ben Hansen, and I work for the American Society of Church History as an assistant to the editors for the journal Church History Studies in Christianity and Culture. And our guest today for an interview is um, Dr. Elizabeth Clark, Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Religion at Duke University. Uh, whose reputation precedes her. Um, she recently guest edited a virtual edition of Church History, hand selecting a number of articles published in the journal over the past seven decades on the themes of monasticism, asceticism, and gender in early Christianity. Uh, you can find this issue online on the Church History Cambridge Core website uh, under virtual issues. But in uh, addition to guest editing this issue, Professor Clark has graciously agreed to join us today for an interview on her work and on the field of late antiquity in general and Christianity and religion in late antiquity in particular. And we are very honored to have her here for a few questions. And with that, Professor Clark, welcome. Thank you so much. So as I mentioned, um, you recently served as a guest editor for Church History, um, choosing several articles on the themes of monasticism, asceticism, and gender in early Christianity. As you reflect on these, well, seven decades worth of articles, what are some of the main ways in which scholarship on the themes of history and early Christianity has developed in the past two generations? Well, I was um, pleased when Andrea Sturk, the editor of Church History, um, asked me to go over a list she provided of articles uh, about early Christianity that had been published in the journal for the last how many decades. <laughs> and I thought that would be an interesting task. So I got out my pen and started making categories they might fall in. And what did surprise me uh, about this project was that it was hands down <laughs> in terms of the number of articles about gender, monasticism, asceticism, et cetera, compared to other categories one might think of or um, names of famous theologians and so forth. And, uh, in early Christianity, so that kind of decided it so I could convince myself it wasn't just my personal interest, shall we say, if I thought actually with that. Now I want to say here that, um, you know, there used to be a big joke about, um, among people in my kind of field or me, medievalists even, uh, and, and instead of calling it the American Society of Church History, they really ought to call it the Society of American Church History <laughs> because it was so overwhelmingly Americanist. And I think that recent editors have done, um, I think quite a good job in trying to broaden out the, uh, the representation of the different periods of history of Christianity in the journal. So uh, I'm afraid we can't make that joke anymore <laughs> that uh, many of the issues I looked at had two articles at least on early Christianity. Um, so. So that was uh, that was that was kind of a pleasant, interesting thing to see here. Yeah. So um, in general, there's been, and here we talk about mostly American scholars, a great deal more interest in interacting with uh, social history, with the classicists. I would say the classicists, when they discovered there was this huge treasure trove of uh, materials and patristics, <laughs> they, they leapt to it here. <laughs> and uh, um, so I think there's more interaction there. And in fact, in some places you can't really tell what department a person might be in, in terms of what they work on or what their main interests are. Um, might be in classics, might be in history, might be in religious studies, uh, whatever. So that's, that's been very pleasant to me to see the broadening out of um, the field here and more interaction with um, 
whether you want to call it adjoining fields, <laughs> but at least fields in the humanities and social sciences, particularly, um, that might be useful for um, understanding early Christianity in a somewhat different mode than in the old days. <laughs> Certainly. Excellent. Um, yes, that field of um, patristics you've written about, and you've written um, about the shift from calling what we do patristics to calling it early Christian studies. And to some extent, um, this might parallel a similar shift in scholarship from the field of church history um, to a broader field of the history of Christianity. Um, in 1997, when church history moved to Duke University and you became one of its editors, the subtitle Studies in Christianity and Culture was added to the journal's title. Do you think that this um, shift of uh, nomenclature is, is something that actually reflects the, um, the diversity of departments and scholars that have come into the field? Um, why do we need to study uh, not just church history, but Christianity and culture? Mm -hmm. Well, um, in the years when church history was edited out of Duke, uh, the board was Grant Wacker, Richard Heitzenreiter, uh, Hans Hellebrand, and myself. That was supposed to cover major fields. <laughs> uh, so uh, we did that. We argued about a number of things, whether changing the title or adding to the title, really, um, of church history, uh, that a studies in Christianity and culture was a good thing or not necessary thing or whatever. But I think it has um, prompted uh, scholars to, to look a little bit further abroad <laughs> for the connections they might have with uh, other disciplines and so forth. And, you know, so um, yeah, of course, the title patristics, uh, <laughs> a lot of people don't want to give it up. <laughs> and we had many debates in um, the North American Patristic Society over whether we should change the title of our society or not, and which resulted usually in rancor or jokes, one or the other. <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, so we ended up sort of keeping it for the time being. We shall see about that. But but it was too male patristics, you know. Obviously, the word itself is, and um, and um, you know a, a little churchy. You'd say, in a way, when you study patristics, can you even study quote unquote heretics? Right? If we're going to talk about the church fathers, many of these people were not church fathers in many way. I mean, origin being case in point, <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Um, so I, th I think it was uh, um, important to uh, broaden out the field and, um, uh, and especially as new texts were being discovered in uh, different languages and areas, et cetera, and just limiting it to male, <laughs> you know, bishops and writers and so on. Um, <clears throat> in early Christianity, it seemed a little outdated, shall we say. So um, I'm glad we made that change. And um, I hope it's made some part of a difference in submissions to the journal, et cetera. Yeah. Excellent. I think um, just even judging from the articles that you selected for the virtual I issue online, um, certainly the more recent articles, I think it has made a difference. There's there's a noticeable broadening in the topics and the approaches, which um, we appreciate. Yeah. I, I could add here that uh, certainly for Americanists, some of them were rather reluctant to even consider what we do in early Christianity history. <laughs> we don't have archives. We don't. Have, you you can fill in the rest there, um, etc. So um, if we were going to get our foot in the door a little more firmly here, that uh, we certainly wanted to uh, broaden out to, um, to wider cultural issues. Now. That makes good sense, yeah. Um, turning to um, some of your own reflections in your work, in your 
we'll call it an autobiographical essay from 20 um, from 2015 the retrospective self mm -hmm. you draw our attention right away at the beginning and then uh, at the end to the fact that the present shapes the construction of the past and you, of course you apply this rule to um, your own self um, um, biography yourself your history as a scholar but Using this principle, can we uh, apply this principle to the field of early Christianity or late antique religious history today? That is to say, how is our contemporary present, with all its craziness, <laughs> shaping the way scholars are studying late antiquity today, uh, for good or for ill? Mm -hmm. Well, I think just taking first the topic of uh, asceticism and so forth that uh, we talked about before, certainly you can see how that was prompted by cultural issues in the wider society. The women's movement, gay and lesbian movement, um, rise of interest in the body with Peter Brown's famous book on the body and society, which did a great deal. Yeah, yeah. And then eventually, I guess uh, you could say, Foucault's volumes on the history of sexuality, which uh, I think many people in early Christianity read with some interest and often a lot of critique. <laughs> but uh, so I think that was a kind of cultural issue here. But um, you know, some of the issues uh, like slavery that's come to great prominence, I think, the past few years is people have to acknowledge in, in different countries, not only in America, but certainly South Africa and so forth, of uh, the problems that this occasioned. And perhaps along with the decolonization, um, you know, the European nations taking over parts of Africa, India, et cetera, et cetera, and um, what their legacy was and so forth. That has become a little less Western shall we say, Western-oriented in its sympathies, um, uh, I think. So I think that is all to a good thing. And certainly now, and this may have something to do with your own work, uh, the rise of Islam, um, certainly that's a great field for, <laughs> uh, for scholars who are interested in doing that and get the requisite language training, which has, uh, same, is very difficult. To, you know, when I was in graduate school, you did Greek and Latin and that was it. <laughs> uh, that was the fathers of the church. But uh, obviously things have changed a great deal since then. Yeah. So I think we can say that. So yes, a lot of issues of the press. It doesn't mean everything has to be kind of present oriented, but there's no doubt that currents in the world today stimulate people to think about their ancient material in somewhat different ways, perhaps, than they had before, identify new topics of research and so forth. So um, yeah. Yes, the um... I've never, I've never felt um, that I loved Greek and, and Latin so much than when I started to uh, attempt to learn Arabic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it suddenly became all so clear in comparison, um, but we'll see. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you touched on this and um, this is kind of getting one of my, my questions just slightly out of order, but um, you know, as you began your career, for example, as you just mentioned, the topic of asceticism was um, vastly understudied. It was, the question was, why would you study something as strange as that? But the last 30 years of scholarship, as you've noted, have helped to remedy um, mm -hmm. this gap in our knowledge. Um, what do you think has taken the place of uh, asceticism today? That is to say, what, um, what's the elephant in the room um, that needs more attention, that needs um, um, a good 20 years of uh, solid research and publications to bring it to light. Do you have an idea or two? Well, um, I think what I've read about what you're doing maybe exemplifies some of it. Uh, my advice would be go east. <laughs> yeah, and certainly uh, Christianity and Armenia and Persia, all these places that certainly I didn't know anything about <laughs> when I was in graduate school, that that is really coming into its own. And I think 
there, some of my friends tell me there's quite a lot of Armenian texts that it would be very interesting to study. Of course, uh, the finding of uh, the Nag Hammadi um, materials um, seems like a long time ago. <laughs> uh, um, that stimulated rise of interest in Egypt, but which has gone way beyond Nag Hammadi now. And you think the amount of work on Shanuti and people like that, um, um, I, I think has been very prominent. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Moving, uh, moving on, I guess we'd say to questions of uh, methodology and theory, I was, um, struck and delighted when uh, reading your autobiographical article um, concerning your early training in philosophy, okay. noting that one time you had considered uh, you, that you might become a Kierkegaard scholar. Um, but how did this philosophical training or other forms of training which were not specifically related to classical languages and um, history, how did they help you as a historian of early Christianity? Mm -hmm. And do you think broader intellectual training is lacking in early Christian mm -hmm. studies today? Or um, oh, I'm sure it varies from place to place, but are, are we doing a good job preparing new students to um, avoid compartmentalization of their field and their specialty? Yeah. Well, about philosophy, um, it, it's interesting that um, I knew I wanted to write a dissertation that had um, something to do with another discipline. And the furthest reach back then, <laughs> in the early 1960s, was philosophy. <laughs> so I had done a fair amount of that in college. And um, that probably the most important uh, course I took in graduate school was a two semester seminar with Paul Oscar Christeller on um, Hellenistic philosophy after Aristotle, which was very important for my dissertation on Clement of Alexandria and um, Aristotelian philosophy. It was a rather short dissertation because there wasn't a whole lot. <laughs> but uh, uh, in, in any case, uh, that struck me. As, but this business about becoming a Kierkegaard scholar was totally ridiculous. I didn't know Danish. And <laughs> I didn't, but it connected with a certain current among intellectuals in that period. Um, yeah, we, we read Camus, we read Sartre, we watched Ingmar Bergman movies, <laughs> death pursuing people, <laughs> and, and so on. And it's kind of, um, I'm sure real Kierkegaard scholars wouldn't put it this way, but it's sort of a gloomier estimate of human nature <laughs> and so forth. Um, it's in here that um, that was, uh, I look back on it and I sort of wonder why. <laughs> you know, there we were 20, 21 years old and you know, full of life and whatever. And uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, sort of incongruous why we should get caught up in this very angst ridden kind of philosophy stuff. But, but um, certainly when I was in graduate school, <laughs> uh, not only did I um, do this uh, long seminar in um, Greco-Roman philosophy, but um, I, I did some work in uh, sort of contemporary critical theory stuff, such as it was then. And I had the only female teacher I've ever had in religion in my life, who was Susan Sontag, which always amazes people. She taught religion, <laughs> yeah. well, briefly at Columbia for a few years, but we read um, we read, uh, I think the course was called something like the dialectic from Plato to Hegel or something like that. So I got quite interested in 19th century philosophy. That was useful for my two rather large books on founding the fathers and refounding the fathers, since they all went to Germany to study, right? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> certainly encountered philosophical currents there, somewhat different from America. So. So we had um, that. 
Do you see, um, just following up somewhat, do you see similar opportunities available for younger scholars today to um, have their, um, their feet in more than one pond, that is? Um, yeah. Well, I think they better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, when I went to write the two books on founding the fathers and refounding the fathers, um, I mean, the whole thing was foolish because I didn't know anything about American history. <laughs> I had a very great learning curve there to go up. But um, I wanted to know how did this discipline get transported, you might say, to the United States. And it was from Germany. It was not from England, although Schaff and other people, you know, had a lot of British friends and scholars there. It, it was really the German influence that made uh, such a difference here and in um, that way. Um, so, um, now what were you asking me again? Sorry, <laughs> I lost it. Oh, I was... I um... <laughs> Asking whether you thought there were similar opportunities uh -huh. to um, for for scholars yeah. to br to branch yeah. out, but I I mean I think your answer that um, we'd better <laughs> is is a good answer. I mean yeah. where um, um, you know a lot of learning is is um, is self taught mm -hmm. by necessity. Yeah. I think so, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, you know, when I finish some of my work on earlier things. I thought, I do not have anything more to say about Augustine. I do not have anything more to say about Jerome. And there's no point in going back and saying it all over again, just in different way. <laughs> uh, so what would be interesting? And I guess I was at the point in my career, I could afford to take some risks here, of uh, branching into a field I knew very little about. So. Um, that has been pleasant to me that there's been relatively good reception of those works, I could say, though no doubt scholars in American church history can always find many things to probably say I left out and was wrong about and so forth. Yeah, we have um, that. But yeah, for, for your scholars today, I really think they, they need to get out of this solely Greek and Latin patristics and start learning the languages, as you know. Certainly now, just about all my students, former graduate students at Duke, um, now an aging cohort, I must say, <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, that they, a lot of them did Syriac, a lot of them did Coptic, many did both. Some started in Ar Armenian and uh, Ethiopic and so forth. And, and that has, um, you know, been able to broaden their um, horizons and there's this material there to look at, right? And fresh material that hasn't been overworked <laughs> as so many of um, Greek and Latin fathers have been <laughs> uh, a little overworked here, maybe. Yes, indeed. Uh, something new, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, um, uh, just a final question sort of on methodology and approach, you were undoubtedly a pioneer in the application of what we'll call literary theory, um, mm -hmm. though it goes by many names <laughs> to ancient texts. Okay. Um, looking back after so many years of this groundbreaking work, are there a couple facets which you would say were, were a couple, uh, what were the most important fruits of this application um, what has this methodology taught us um, about late antique Christianity? Mm -hmm. And then, on the other hand, if 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 you believe it's also caused problems or confusions, I wonder if you might point those yeah. out as well. Yeah, um, certainly encourage a certain kind of critical thinking. For example, along the lines of. It's not just what's in the text, it's what's left out of the text, <laughs> the gaps and absences and so on, as I've written about. And I must say, at the time of uh, theory, quote unquote, height, <laughs> um, maybe in the 1990s, um, being at Duke, if you wanted to talk to anybody else in the humanities, you had to get some <laughs> handle on all this, right? So, and I got a little tired of going to meetings, including the Church History Society and my own department and have people make jokes about, you know, Derrida or something, <laughs> and, which 
clearly showed they hadn't read any of it. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So that was why I wrote history theory text. And it, it surprised me. And professors are still in history departments are still ordering this book for their seminars and classes and so forth. It's, um, it was, again, quite out of my main field of study. But uh, um, I think that was helpful. Um, there. But now, of course, um, this last volume of Foucault's History of Sexuality that has just been translated into English, um, The Confessions of the Flesh, um, the ones leading up to it, now, this all has a very um, complex history as the people who have been working in the archives uh, have told us now that uh, actually Foucault started working on some of these books on history sexuality way before <laughs> yeah, he uh, did some of his later works. Uh, but this last one, Confessions of the Flesh, you know, he went to the library every day and read through, I think, the source credian volumes of Church Father material, um, et cetera. So, and uh, I've, I've done a paper on Augustine. I don't think he reads Augustine quite right. <laughs> That's right. Up for debate on what you do with uh, that. So that was a good. I, I think a good example, uh, for example, of... Um, <clears throat> The use of Foucault as a kind of lens is in the recent book, I think 2020, by uh, Nikki Clements, um, Sites of the Ascetic Self, which is about John Cashin and how Cashin's version of monasticism as a kind of self development and self cultivation, et cetera, et cetera, um, she finds quite close to some of the themes in the later Foucault um, work here, All right? Um, of course, as you and others know, that the Augustinians were not so pleased with John Cash. <laughs> they thought he was overemphasizing human you know, activity and so forth, rather than the grace of God. But I think it's a very good example of uh, how you can use a modern theorist to give you some new insights into um, an older thinker. Yeah. So that was, that was good. Good. Um, it reminds me, and, and I'll just do a little promotion for the American Society of Church History website. If, um, if you go to the teaching and research archive, there is a, um, you'll find a link if you're, um, an intrepid, uh, <laughs> if you're um, able to navigate the website, search for um, Peter Brown, and there's a discussion that he had just a couple months ago on the um, Confessions of the Flesh and yeah. um, Foucault's um, influence on him and his on Foucault, which I think is probably salient to some of what you've been saying. So there, the video is out there for those who would like to find it. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, well. Well, let's just go to a final question. You've been very generous in your time. And this question you've actually already answered in several ways, but we'll see if you um, if there's anything that you might add to it. Um, if you had a word of advice or encouragement, which you mm -hmm. haven't given already to scholars of early Christian history today, those just starting out, those just starting to teach, um, what would you tell them? What encouragement could you give uh -huh. them? It's probably not very encouraging, <laughs> as you and others know, and they know from looking at the job situation, there are almost no jobs. And in some fields like New Testament, there's just a total backlog of people who have PhDs in New Testament, and there's not jobs for them, and at least not in the kind of schools they might want to teach in. Uh, so I don't know, I'd say to undergraduates, you know, who think they might want to go on and do this, you know, think hard of, uh, is this really the passion of your life, so to speak, and uh, that can carry you through, and even if you don't get a great job or don't get one right away, um, is it worth it to you, you know? Um, you know, all the time, especially at a place like Duke, you had all these parents encouraging their students to go into science and computer stuff and whatever, yeah. uh, so they can make a living, <laughs> which the parents, of course, are interested in. Yeah. But um, 
I think right there, right there, that it's um, important to make some decisions about, do you care about this enough? They're going to be willing to put up with, <laughs> you know, maybe moving around from place to place for several years and picking up little adjunct things here and there and so forth. That isn't encouraging advice, but um, um, I think that's the situation we're in now. And I don't particularly see college and university administration switching back to hiring huge numbers of humanities professors in the future. Yeah. Here and there, a few maybe, but uh, we have that. So, um, yeah. And I'd say certainly it's a time to get your languages under control and especially some of those difficult <laughs> more eastern ones but also um you know i've heard so many not just americanists but other people in church history say, oh yeah well we had to learn french and german but i've never used german since i took the german exam i know that's not going to be the case in early christianity you're going to need that a lot <laughs> And you're probably, depending on particular areas of interest, uh, Italian scholarship has flourished for many, many decades now. And certainly Spain is contributing more by way of scholars, Latin America. So um, there's a lot of modern languages that need to be uh, to here. Now here, Andrea Sturk is rather uh, exemplary in the languages she knows of Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, and that has enabled her to do a, a certain kind of uh, research um, you know, in that field that other people wouldn't be able to do without the languages. You know, you know, so, yeah. Good. I, well, it's 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 a it's a certain sort of encouragement. It's the it's the ice cold water of truth. <laughs> <laughs> So we need to be sober and um, clear eyed and uh, mm -hmm. be willing to put in a lot of work on, on difficult topics. So, but if you love it, if it's yeah. what interests yeah. you, sure. you, you do it. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Well, thank you so much for spending this time here today and for your work for the journal in the past and for your recent work for the journal. And of course, all your, scholarship and instruction and um, what you've added to this field and for talking with me today. I greatly appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. And it was a pleasure finding out a little about your work. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> what little what little there is to find out. All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>